In an instant, four Florida construction workers are trapped in a collapsed trench. As the sandy, wet soil comes crashing down, their co-workers fight desperately to unearth them before they suffocate. When paramedics and rescue teams arrive, they find three of the men fighting for every breath. Fear never entered my mind. There was victims in there, and, and I was going to help them out any way I could. Trapped beneath tons of rock and soil, the terrified victims' friends and loved ones wait anxiously. We've gone through five different plans, and uh, you're thinking, we're not going to get these guys out of here before they die. Emergency personnel fight fatigue in the elements to keep the victims from being buried alive. The city of Margate, Florida, a growing suburb outside of Fort Lauderdale, was home to Elise and Floyd Bogan. Under Floyd's work-worn exterior, Elise saw a loving heart. He was all she had ever hoped for and more. Life was good. Floyd worked in construction, sometimes helping crews lay pipe in trench excavations. He knew it was a dangerous job. There are nearly 700 trench collapse injuries in the United States every year. There are 60 deaths. Three quarters of those are construction workers. The rest are would-be rescuers. On November 7, 1996, Floyd was working on a water and sewer trench, about five feet wide, 30 feet long, and over 12 feet deep. His crew that day was Cleo Brazuela, Don Price, and Oscar Escobar. Bogan needed to install the pipe in the trench quickly. Loose sand from the walls continued to refill the trench. The sandy, granular soil made excavating the area difficult for the backhoe operator. Even the vibrations from the backhoe weakened the surrounding soil. Because they were so close to sea level, groundwater seeped into the trench. Bogan inserted a pump to get rid of most of the water. But some water remained, making the trench even more unstable. Bogan was becoming concerned about the stability of the trench. A construction foreman arrived to review the excavation's progress with the backhoe operator. The trench walls collapsed. In a matter of seconds, trench workers were buried under hundreds of cubic yards of sand and soil. 
The force that hit them was equal to being run over by a pickup truck. Where are the others at? Only Don Price could be seen above the rubble. Risking their own lives, the backhoe operator and his co-worker quickly freed him. Though his ankle was broken, Price raced to get to stable ground. The workers continued to search for the three men who were still buried. Suffocation would take place in the next three minutes. Come on, gate 911. Do you have an emergency? The construction foreman called 911 from a nearby office. The dispatcher relayed the call to the nearest rescue unit. Okay. One minute had gone by since the collapse. The men were still buried. The backhoe operator uncovered the arm of one of the men from under the dirt. It was Floyd Bogan. He was barely conscious. The pressure on his chest was so great, he couldn't expand his lungs to breathe. Yet, he was alive. As they worked to free Bogan, they discovered that he was trapped beneath the surface. The men continued to search desperately for the other two workers. They soon realized that it wasn't just sand and dirt that had fallen but a huge van-sized coral boulder had rolled over on the men. Bogan's left leg was pinned beneath the massive rock. The Margate Fire Rescue Station responded to the urgent call. After more digging, they found another worker. It was Cleo Brizuela. He was bleeding from the mouth, badly crushed, yet remarkably alive. He too was having trouble breathing. Though two of the men were now exposed, all three were still trapped under the massive boulder. The backhoe operator would attempt to use the force of the eight-ton machine to extract the injured men. But he quickly realized that the boulder was too large and wedged too tightly. He couldn't move it without risking further injury to the men. A second paramedic unit from the Margate Fire Department raced to the scene. The tremendous weight of the soil prevented Bogan and Brizuela from breathing. Although their heads were above ground, they were slowly suffocating. As rescue leader Rob Davis arrived, 
he saw that the trench walls still posed a considerable threat to any rescue attempt. I had asked the other co-workers who were digging the, the patients out to please stop what you're doing. We'll take, take over from here. Please leave the trench at this time, which they did. He didn't want to risk further casualties. The emergency medical team sensed the co-workers panic. I asked him, what, where are you hurt? What's going on? He says, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And I kept asking. His main response was, please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. And I said, I'm here. Don't worry, calm down. Just listen, calm down and we'll get you out of here. I'm not going anywhere. Ty Vassell, a paramedic with the Margate Fire Department, saw that groundwater continued to seep, further destabilizing the trench. Well, the soil at the time was wet, and there was a lot of rock in the soil. Um, the individuals, as we were unearthing them up to their waist so that they could breathe, we realized that they were deeply, deeply pinned down. The rescue team checked the two trapped men as they looked for the third. Airway and breathing were their first concern. Ty, we could use some oxygen. Grab Davis instructed Vassal to get oxygen from the rescue vehicle. If they stopped breathing, reviving them would be nearly impossible. It had now been eight minutes since the collapse. If there was any chance of still saving Escobar, they'd have to find him quickly. One of the first concerns for Davis was to stabilize Bogan's breathing. We did put him on oxygen just because he said he was tired, he was exhausted. Paramedic Louis Villard needed to stabilize Brizuela. The blood from his mouth likely meant he had internal bleeding. Vizuela only spoke Spanish. Villar was fluent, and he was able to reassure him. As I spoke to him, uh, I guess in his face I saw a sigh of relief at the fact that he just could communicate with me. I tried to make him as, as at ease as possible. Psychologically, you have to help the individuals not lose hope because then the outcome becomes worse. I reassured him that I would do everything in my power to get him out of there safe and sound. Um, and that's all I could promise him. Finally, they located Escobar. He was below Bogan, tangled in his feet. As I looked to my left, just below him, there was a huge void. And you can look in there and you can see water and gravel, and that's where you saw the third victim. He was deceased. He was looking back at me, and it almost appeared like he was almost snapped in half. So it, it was, it was a, a tough scene. His co-worker's death was taking its toll on Floyd Bogan but there were still urgent matters for the rescuers to attend to. And I was concerned about that wall coming down on us. In fact, looking at that wall, I was specifically remembering a utility line, mainly probably about no more than two and a half, three inches. But that was really holding up that integrity of the wall. So, and that's not much support for that type of a wall. Even with the two men still trapped and badly injured, they needed to focus on the deteriorating condition of the trench. They couldn't use shovels because the space around the men was tight. And when they dug with their hands, the loose sandy soil would refill the space they had just cleared. The rescue workers were at the mercy of the unstable trench. As we were digging out, it was like you're digging muck, but we were in the water table, and it, for every scoop I took out, it's like three scoops would fall back in, and it was like I wasn't getting anywhere. Oh, 
Without any shoring in the trench, the possibility of a second collapse was high. The rescue workers immediately set to work, determined that the trench would not consume the two men who were still clinging to life. In 1996, a construction trench collapsed in Margate, Florida. Two men were trapped, a third had already died. The paramedics pieced together the limited supplies at hand to brace the walls against any further collapse. They even went so far as to use their own backboards. We had to make sure the safety was number one on our priority. And then we could deal with digging them out. We didn't want to become casualties ourselves as we stood there and tried to save their lives. Plywood, two by fours, everything they could put their hands on was commandeered in order to buttress the unstable walls but they couldn't get a stable support base. I guess I was a little frightened at the fact that we might not be able to save these individuals because these walls could collapse at any time. And if this wall of soil falls on these individuals, I, I can't dig them out fast enough to save their lives. Lieutenant Hector Corona of the Margate Fire Department saw how precarious the situation had become. We determined that the backboards were, were going to be somewhat helpful, um, but we also determined once there was a boulder and once we kept seeing dirt trickling down, that the backboards were not going to uh, do the job. And we definitely needed a technical rescue team out here uh, immediately. And that's when I made the call for them to respond. The Broward County Technical Rescue Team was called. Their involvement freed the Margate team to focus on medical treatment and urgent care. Lieutenant Mike Nugent led the Broward team's efforts. Well, what we could give to this rescue effort was we carry equipment that uh, the fire engines and the fire apparatus don't carry on a day-to-day -day basis. While the firemen braced the walls with boards and two-by-fours, they continued to reassure the men trapped in the trench. Their emotional state was just as important as their physical well-being if they were to survive. Villar also reassured Brizuela, who was suffering from shortness of breath. He did say something that was kind of bone-chilling when you have a person there that you're, you're talking to, you're telling you're going to rescue, and the guy tells you, listen, I know I'm dead. Just let me go. Leave me alone pretty much let me die in peace. That's when you increase your, your efforts and you make sure that you let him know that you're doing everything and he's gonna be fine, and that's what we did. Davis examined the men and continued trying to free their legs, but he still couldn't keep sand from filling the hole. When he finally freed the leg, he discovered it was actually Escobar's. The deceased man was entangled with Bogan. LT, we got a lot of water down here. A lot more water. The pump could not stay ahead of the groundwater, which continued to fill the trench. The uh, water level started to rise, which was complicating uh, the situation with the victims. Uh, every effort that we made, water and mud would uh, continue to fill up the holes. But we were uh, afraid of them drowning. The rescue team had to pump the water out of the trench. It was eroding the soil out from under them. With the makeshift shoring in place, they could now get some of the dirt out. The coral boulder was curved in such a way that it had hit the men's upper bodies, but hadn't completely crushed their chest cavities. Davis and the other paramedics worked to free Floyd Bogan. The cramped quarters made it slow going and exhausting. Bogan's pulse had dropped. 
breathing remained difficult. Paramedic Ty Vassell wasn't sure what effect this was having on brain function. He called for assistance. The trauma surgeon on duty at a local hospital had heard about the accident, but hadn't realized how serious it was. Vassell filled him in. He described in detail what they were looking at. The surgeon wasn't sure if he could assist Bogan's deteriorating condition, but based on Vassell's diagnosis in the trench, he knew the situation was grim. The technical rescue teams arrived on the scene. They were trained to perform special operations like bridge rescues and trench collapses. The first order of business was to get new bracing in place while paramedics attended to the injured. Brizuela was fading. He told the paramedics that he wanted to sleep or die. Villar found that his heart rate was dropping. Vassal was alarmed. It could mean that Brizuela was going into decompensated shock, a condition where the body's heart rate decreases, compensating for low pressure in the tissues. Villar knew he had to keep him awake or he might slip away for good. Along with having a high heart rate, the patient was losing pressure. And we knew time was of the essence. The technical rescue team realized the makeshift shoring done in haste by Margate was extremely unsafe. Well, the problem with the shoring that was first put into the trench is it wasn't supported. It wasn't the right material to be used. If something had moved, it would have blown it right apart and never would have held up. They would use the stronger 3 quarter inch 16 layer plywood as shoring walls, supported with horizontal 2 by 12s. To prevent worker fatigue, they began to change out the paramedics. They had asked me to leave the trench. I was soaking wet and I was tired. But again, my adrenaline, my enthusiasm, I was kind of bummed when I had to leave because I wanted to stay there. But again, they needed to get some fresh personnel in there. And I want to say probably within the next hour, I got called back to help with the shoring. The Broward team continued to build the new support framework. Well, the type of plywood that we used is very hard, very heavy. It has a, a resin coating on it to protect it from water and from the soil. On that plywood, we attach a 2x12. We put the panels in on both sides with the strong back, so those boards facing each other on the inside. Now we have a nailing surface that we can secure the strut to. In addition to the wood structure, they used hydraulic bracing that would apply continuous outward pressure, even if the sand eroded away behind the boards. Robert Herschel led the technical rescue team from Fort Lauderdale. Uh, there were two groups that were working on the shielding and shoring. The Broward County Technical Rescue Team and the City of Fort Lauderdale Technical Rescue Team were both working together to get that uh, task accomplished. Generally, when you have an incident like that, your resources are going to even use up more than the two teams. So we, we usually call another team in. So they called Fort Lauderdale in along with Broward County to assist. The technical rescue teams finally got the new bracing in place. They'd solved one problem. Now the real work would begin. They had to get the men out. The location of these victims was up against the side of the trench, underneath a lip. So it wasn't possible to drop shoring. So we had to put shoring on either side of them. Both had received traumatic injuries from this coral hitting them. One uh, victim was vomiting blood and whatever contents he had in his system this individual was getting ready to give up. To improve conditions, TRT members set up an air filtration system to get fresh air down into the trench. The surgeon was apprised of the trapped worker's conditions. Bogan was not sure he could hang on while they worked to release him. 
Because of the standing water, hypothermia was becoming a very real threat. Hypothermia is a condition where your body's core temperature, if it is lowered enough, it could result in you going unconscious. Um, that is one of our concerns. We don't want our patient to go into shock. We don't want him to become unconscious. We don't want his body core temperature to drop down where he would become hypothermic. As it started to get dark, the rescue team set up generator-powered lights. The trapped men knew their prospects of getting out grew worse. Elise Bogan, informed of the trench collapse, rushed to the scene. She desperately feared for her husband's life. In an instant, four Florida construction workers are trapped in a collapsed trench. As rescuers race to unearth the buried victims, they uncovered the arm of Floyd Bogan. A huge van-sized coral boulder had rolled over on the men. Despite being stabilized with oxygen, Bogan was still far from being free. Margate paramedic Ty Vassell knew time was working against them. After an hour of entrapment, uh, the, the possibility of death just increases greatly. As night descended, their prospects of getting out grew worse. The medical and resuscitation divisions who had been standing by were alerted. They didn't want to waste precious seconds getting them to a trauma center once the men were released. I can tell you from the rescuer's point of view, one of the hardest, one of the hardest things on a long-term incident, when the incident goes for a long period of time, is fatigue of the rescuers. Most of our emergencies, you know, last 15 or so minutes or less. And when the scope of the incident, when the timeline of the incident stretches into the six hour mark, fatigue starts to take place. As her husband Floyd lay trapped and helpless, Elise Bogan could resort only to tears. The TRT members discussed their options to free the men. They told the frightened workers they'd work as fast as they could to free them. Bogan feared he might never see his wife again. The first task for the technical rescue teams was to place large 4x4 four four blocks under the boulder. Then they inserted a deflated airbag. This was an inflatable high pressure bag that could possibly allow them to lift the boulder in tiny increments. They hooked up the bag to a hydraulic hose and filled it with air. But when it pressed against the rock, the force didn't move the boulder. Rather, it drove the boards into the soft sand. There wasn't anything solid to wedge the bag against. Overseeing the rescue efforts was Lieutenant Robert Herschel of the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. Well, the airbag method didn't work because our cribbing was actually being, was being mashed down into the mud instead of the boulder being lifted. It was just too big of a rock. Mike Nugent, leader of the Broward Technical Rescue Team, had another idea. They would try a hydraulic lift. This device is capable of bringing huge pressure to bear on the rock. Yeah. 
Once again, the soft soil underneath it gave way. These methods were proving useless. The rock simply wasn't going to budge. With the media hovering at the scene, Chief Garrison Westbrook realized they were faced with an additional hindrance. When the helicopters arrived, there's approximately uh, six or seven networks in, in this area. This is a fairly metropolitan area, and all of them had their helicopters at the scene. At one time, I believe we had five units up uh, in the sky. Now, they were getting as close as, as possible for their cameras, and they were very loud. If you ever had a, heard a helicopter, you can imagine what four or five sound like. And at that point, uh, after about 10 minutes' time, we couldn't even communicate on our radios because of the, the noise. The rescuers were frustrated in their efforts. As the paramedics tended to the patients, conditions in the trench worsened. Water was certainly a concern. They had been essentially submerged in water for hours. You know, their will to live was uh, diminishing uh, with every minute, so we had to try to get them out of there as best we could. To prevent hypothermia and raise the patient's body temperatures, they wrapped the trapped men in protective plastic blankets. The technical rescue teams from Broward County and Fort Lauderdale regrouped to discuss how they were going to remove the men from under the rock. Well, it was frustrating. Uh, We've gone through three, four, five different plans and nothing was working. Uh, so it was getting frustrating, it was getting late, it was getting dark, and uh, you're, you're thinking, we're not gonna get these guys out of here before they die. It's, uh, it's, it's a very frustrating feeling. Desperate for answers, they thought amputation might be their only option. We asked the orthopedic surgeon on scene whether amputation would be an option. Uh, he ruled it out uh, due to the, to the immense amount of groundwater that was in the trench. News that the rescue attempts had been unsuccessful was not what Elise Bogan had hoped to hear. As the rescue workers' frustrations grew, Floyd Bogan was not sure how much longer he would last. For four hours, rescue workers had tried to free two trapped men from a collapsed construction trench. Their efforts so far had been frustrated. Lieutenant Robert Herschel led the Fort Lauderdale Technical Rescue Team. When I looked in there, I'm trying to think of a tool that we'd use to cut the metal bar the patient's leg was wrapped around. Knew we couldn't use an electric tool because it was underwater and uh, hydraulic cutters would be too dangerous because his leg was wrapped around it as well. So I'm trying to think of a tool that would be small enough to get in there. Uh, so a pneumatic air chisel was uh, the tool of choice. We just came to my mind, hey, I need an air chisel in here. And uh, they got an air chisel in there and uh, started using it. The TRT members decided that if they couldn't move the entire boulder, they'd move it piece by piece. They couldn't use a large jackhammer, as that would endanger the men. Instead, they would employ a small pneumatic air chisel. It was light enough to maneuver in the cramped quarters, but sturdy enough to pulverize the rock.
the rescuers had to chip away the solid rock, which was right next to Cleopas Wela. With only one chisel, they would have to wait to see if it worked before attempting to free Floyd Bogan. The rescuers did all they could to keep the trapped men awake and alert. They suspected Brizuela was bleeding internally. Without extra blood, he would pass out. If the rescuers could keep him talking, they knew that he was still conscious and his airway was free. They gave him two liters of whole blood as the rescue team used the air chisel to get him out. With his health failing and time running out, the rescuers worked to free him. It was slow going. They were able to chip away only small pieces of the boulder. Margate paramedic Ty Vassell alerted the local trauma center and called for a medevac helicopter to respond. Well, there's a rule that if there's 15 minutes of entrapment, 10 to 15 minutes of entrapment, you consider a more rapid transport. So after the first 10 minutes, when it was clear that we weren't going to be able to unearth these people with shovels and, and with our bare hands, we knew that the aircraft response would be critical for this situation. To extract Brizuela, the rescue workers lowered a Stokes basket into the trench. Then they braced his neck to prevent any further injury. Brazuela was free. The helicopter landed as close as it could, but it was still a quarter mile away. In order to keep the patient stable, they loaded him into a waiting ambulance. Ty Bassel rode with him. As they began their drive toward the chopper, Brazuela began to choke. Vassal quickly realized that Brazuela's blood was draining into his lungs. He inserted an adjunct pipe, which passed through his mouth into his chest, allowing him to breathe properly. Since he had been erect in the trench, his internal bleeding hadn't collected in his lungs. But now that he was lying down, the blood had nowhere to drain. Brazuela was out of the trench, but not stable. As he was moved from the ambulance into the waiting helicopter, the pilot contacted air controllers requesting that all airspace be cleared. In the busy skies over the Fort Lauderdale, Miami metro area, this was essential to the rescuers' efforts.
After five long hours in the trench, Brizuela was now only 10 minutes away from the medical treatment he needed. He was hypothermic and had internal injuries. The helicopter took the first patient to the trauma center and we asked for a rapid turnaround of the helicopter to come retrieve the second patient. Cleo Brizuela was headed to the hospital. Floyd Bogan remained desperate and trapped. In Margate, Florida, in 1996, a trench had collapsed, killing one worker and trapping two others under a large boulder. After several thwarted attempts, the rescue workers were using a pneumatic air chisel to cut away at the boulder. But the rescuers soon discovered they would have to work upside down and underwater to get the last man free. One of the trapped workers had been extricated. The other, Floyd Bogan, remained pinned. But just as they were getting close to releasing him, the rescuers were faced with a new obstacle. They discovered that a steel pipe blocked their path. More of the rock would then have to be removed to pull his leg up and over. Steel intertwined with flesh. It made Bogan's extrication even more difficult, according to Lieutenant Robert Herschel of Fort Lauderdale's technical rescue team. Well, the, the first thing we had to do was cut away the steel pipe that he was wrapped around, a chip at a time uh, on the steel pipe. And then once I did that, uh, we got a hose line in there and moved some more soil and then used the air chisel, not on the steel, but on the rock itself. Piece by piece, the rock began to give way. Bogan was near collapse. The Broward team was concerned the trapped man was close to passing out. They called for the paramedics. Fatigue was setting in, and they urged him not to give up. As Elise Bogan maintained a constant vigil, the paramedics informed her that everything possible was being done to save her husband's life. Lieutenant Robert Herschel coordinated the efforts. Getting him out of the trench took a lot of work. Using an air chisel to chip away enough of the rock and a, and a fire hose to blow away some of the material away from his leg. And it just took a brute force and just a lot of manipulation of his leg and trying to get enough material uh, away from his extremity that we could get him out of there. And he complained, he screamed, but uh, I felt his, his foot was loose and his leg and I, it was just, you know, just grab it and go, just pull as hard as you can to, to get him out of there. Finally, Bogan felt his leg slip loose. He was free. It probably took an hour and a half once we got the air chisel in there to get him out, it, uh, it wasn't a, a, a speedy process. It, uh, it took some time. Uh, the rock is soft and the blade kept sinking into it, so you're just using it a chip at a time, just chipping away a little bit at a time. Again, you can't see where you're working, so you're just going by feel uh, with your arms fully extended and you're, you're almost upside down in this hole uh, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to work. They still had to lift out Bogan. The paramedics brought in a halfback extrication harness.
Between the pull on the harness and the men working in the trench, they were able to lift Bogan up and out from under the boulder. To stabilize him, they placed him on a backboard and secured it to a Stokes basket. He was covered in blood and suffering from excruciating pain. After being trapped for hours, Floyd Bogan was finally freed from the trench. I just bring him down. I just get four corners. There you go. He was suffering from a concussion, and he complained of extreme back and leg pain. He was hypothermic, and they needed to raise his body temperature as soon as possible. The combined efforts of the Margate Fire Rescue Department along with the Broward County and Fort Lauderdale technical rescue teams, over 70 people all together, proved that even the most precarious situations can be overcome with ingenuity and tenacity. Two men owe their lives to their efforts. Emotionally, I look back at it, it's a call that'll stay with me a lifetime. I saved a man's life, and that's why I got into the business, um, to run the calls and to make a difference and to save lives. Floyd Bogan and Cleo Brizuela both recovered. They still suffer from permanent injuries from the accident. Don Price was treated at the hospital that day and released. The body of Oscar Escobar was exhumed later that night. <laughs>